All right. Well, I would like to introduce Sarah Klieger. She is the founder and owner of Adaptive Seeds, and she is going to talk to us a little bit about her retail business. I'm ready to go. Hi. Um, I'm so glad to see so many faces in here, as Tessa mentioned. Uh, my name is Sarah Klieger. I am from Adaptive Seeds. We're a small certified organic farm-based seed company. We're located near Sweet Home, Oregon. It's about two hours south of Portland. We farm on land that was once home to the Kalapuya tribe. Um, we started Adaptive Seeds in 2009. That's the same year that we moved on to the farm. In 2018, we are offering 520 varieties. Uh, many of the varieties that we offer aren't available elsewhere commercially. We, we say we're working towards bringing biodiversity back to agriculture and to gardens by trying to increase the number of open pollinated varieties that are available commercially. Um, so 85% of the crops that we sell are grown on our farm. Um, we grow about 300 different crops per year. 170 of these are for sale for the catalog. The rest are for trials, breeding, preservation work, um, and a few crop failures in there too. Um, I manage the field and do most of the field work primary and primary cleaning. Um, you can see here I'm working with peas. This is about the scale that we're at very much hand scale uh, production. So manage the finances. What we don't grow, we contract with a couple of small growers in Oregon and Washington. This is Hank Keough of Avoca Seed here in Corvallis. He is in the room. Um, and you may see a man standing in a lettuce field, but for adaptive seeds, he's a man standing near an onion seed crop. Um, so um, you can get a sense of the size of contracts that we are giving people. It's just a couple pounds usually for things like onions. Um, our goal is to produce three years of a crop with every grow out. This makes it more worth it for our growers and ourselves in isolations. Um, there are costs of maintaining that much inventory though, as Tessa mentioned earlier. Um, so a little bit more of, of where we are currently, uh, in 2017, we sold about 45,000 items, so not too many. Um, this is ranging from a garden size packet up to a five pound quantity. Most of our sales are via our website at adaptiveseeds.com. We also have about 10 seed racks in the Pacific Northwest. We sell a very small amount, it's a yellow in the middle, um, direct to other seed companies, not using the website. Um, a lot of seed companies buy from us in the large packet size online. Um, our market is primarily homestead style gardeners and increasingly small market farmers. So I'm a big fan of donut pie. <laughs> Um, which is what this graph is officially <laughs> called. So I couldn't resist putting it in here. Um, and it shows that uh, in 2017, about 71% of our sales by product were online, um, but that was 85% of our gross income. And <clears throat> uh, whereas seed racks, it was almost 30% of products going out the door, but it was only 15% of our income. So racks are not only a lower price point per item, but they're a small packet only, and the web has many higher dollar items in larger packets. Uh, we see the larger packets to farmers and large gardeners and sales to other seed companies as um, where there's the most potential for growth for our business, and it's also where we think we can make the biggest impact with that goal of bringing biodiversity back, just making more varieties available to other seed companies that then can make these varieties available to more people than we can reach on our own. So um, I'm gonna spend most of my time talking today about what goes into running our small seed company, including the retail overhead, um, a little bit of our version of stock selection and breeding, and um, our take on intellectual property and royalties. 
Whoa, what? That was the wrong button. Uh oh. Um, okay, it's only supposed to be a picture of one cabbage here. I don't know how these got combined. Maybe can someone help me with this? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We could just pretend to look at the right side <laughs> of the screen. That's really the best thing. Okay. Uh oh. Well, bear with me then. Um, so, whole head of cabbage is what we're looking at right now. <laughs> Um, so considering packet sales on the surface, you, you can bring in $1,000 a pound versus the $100 a pound for bulk seed, but a uh, seed company has many parts and many layers, so let's dig deeper. So that's supposed to be the picture in the middle of me cutting open a cabbage head. <laughs> and now we're looking at the pie graph. Um, which is where our money went in 2017. And again, this should be much larger so you guys could read it, but um, I'll try and uh, translate it for you. Um, so on the top left, the dark blue and the orange, that represents our farm-related expenses. So the orange are farm expenses, supplies, fertilizer, um, fuel for the tractor, that sort of thing, seed for planting. The dark blue in the upper left, that's farm-related payroll. So that's planting through primary cleaning, all of the stuff that it takes to grow the crops. Um, together, those are about 16% of uh, the expenses that we had in 2017. The bottom left, that's 34% yellow there, that is our seed company payroll. So that's like all of the admin overhead, um, seed packing, that sort of thing. On the bottom right, the green 30%, those are seed sales related expenses. So that's buying in seed for resale, that's seed testing, um, postage, seed rack, and shipping supplies sort of thing. So seed company specific expenses, it's 64% of our money goes out that way. Um, in the top right, the dark red 11%, that's general business overhead. So that's stuff that would be shared between the, the two kind of halves of our business. Um, insurance, rent, um, accounting services, that sort of thing. And then the light blue in the top, that 9%, that's capital investments. So that's equipment purchases and our new headquarters um, that we've moved our seed packing into. So if you take that top right percent, the, um, that top right light blue and dark red, those are kind of shared equally between the seed production farm side and the um, seed company retail side. That leaves us with about 25% of the money that we spend goes to growing the seed and 75% of the money we spend goes to seed sales as a retail initiative. Seen another way, it's the bottom left picture in this uh, multiple slide thing, um, which is, um, right, the, tw the top left quadrant of that cut open cabbage head. And uh, for the uninitiated, the lots of, one way of growing cabbage is to cut the head open so that the seed stalk can emerge. A lot of times, um, cabbage, it can't get out by itself. I learned this morning, though, that you can also just chop the head off and still get seed. So that's kind of exciting. Um, yeah. Now you get to see seed cleaning team of Carrie and Larry working hard to <laughs> clean seed. Um, so I was just getting into some more of the details of the expenses of running our seed company. Um, so. Um, you know, as, as bulk seed growers, you're responsible to give the seed to relatively clean, but usually it's not really retail ready at that, at least in our experience, maybe other seed companies get seed that's ready to go. Um, but the growers that we work with often don't have the time or technology to get stuff retail ready. So, um, there's a, 
a huge additional cleaning expense compared with the bulk seed. And the way that we break down our farm expenses versus our seed expenses is the farm side is responsible for the first like 95% of the cleaning and the seed company takes over that last um, two to five percent of cleaning. So um, the, the cost for that can add up quite a bit. You know, there's the 80-20 rule that um, 20% of the effort will get you 80% of the way there, but that last 20% of the way takes 80% of the effort. So um, <clears throat> there is that expense. There's also um, the additional testing requirements. So here's uh, James watching over germination testing. We don't do this in-house anymore because he's not a good germ tech. Um, but we spend about $10,000 per year on seed testing, and this is uh, germination and disease primarily. Um, there's a whole lot of puzzles to figure out as far as crop planning goes. Uh, this is Andrew. He does most of our variety selection. Um, crop dry down and irrigation is one thing on a seed farm, making sure your dry seeded crops are separate from your wet seeded crops. Um, but it's not nearly as complicated as all of the hours that are spent researching and obtaining new varieties. Um, then there's all of the expenses uh, around branding and marketing and advertising. And some of this is practically free. Um, Instagram is really great in that way, except for the time it takes to use it. Um, and some of it is easy to account for. We spend about $3,000 a year on advertising print ads, um, but some of it isn't so much. Stuff like taking variety photos, like Andrew's doing here, um, writing essays and blog posts, all really important marketing that uh, the direct expense of that is, is kind of harder to capture. Um, website development and maintenance is a whole nother, I mean, that could be like a whole talk in itself um, for a small seed company or a large one, I guess. Um, and um, web payment processing fees, another $6,000 of that seed company pie um, went to web processing fees in 2017. Um, then there's printing, then there's the money to go to events and market. Um, so we're sort of starting to go to more conferences. Uh, this is me at EcoFarm a few weeks ago. We do have a booth at the trade show here if any of you guys have questions. And so we don't have time to get to today. You can find me there later. Um, but we also print a catalog and send it out to about 14,000 people a year. Um, and so that costs us another $10,000. Um, for retail, there's the question of packaging, design, packet size, layout, all of that stuff. Right now we're running at a per packet cost before seed goes into the packet of $1.20 per packet. That's pretty high. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's embarrassingly high. Um, that's the labor to put it in, all of the other admin -y stuff, um, our very slow plastic Ziploc baggy method compared to paper packets. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, we definitely have room for improvement with that, but um, it's, it's another part of the cost. Um, space is an issue. We always, always need more space. I think most farms always need more space. Uh, seed storage, as previously mentioned, cool, dry, rodent proof. Um, ideally, the temperature and humidity are not more than 100 when combined. Um, this is a, a new seed storage room for us and it's really nice <laughs> compared to our previous situation. Um, workspace. Uh, this, for many years we just operated the business out of a spare bedroom in our house and, um, and our mudroom and our garage and the seed company actually took up 42% of the square footage of our home. <laughs> um, and uh, finally, last year, we found this awesome Craigslist score, which gave us um, additional work <laughs> and expense because it needed quite a bit of renovations. But now we have 400 additional square feet. We call this our HQ, and it's the best thing ever. Um, we moved in in December of 2009. So 
uh, I mean, sorry, December of 2017. So the scale that we're at now is um, we have four full-time year-round people. Beth in the middle there is our order fulfillment assistant, and she does field work as well. Um, and then we have seasonal uh, packet fillers. Here is Kate on the left and Carrie on the right. Um, our, our growth has been pretty organic. Over the first three years, it was 70% per year. More recently, it's been in the 20% range, which is much more manageable. Um, bootstrapping has a lot of challenges. Um, mostly the from one year has to finance the following year's growth. And um, also, the expenses with a retail seed company are highest at the end of the calendar year, but 70% of the money comes in in the first quarter. So managing cash flow can be challenging as well. Um, and as sales increase, so does complexity and other expenses. Um, business classes teach you that to run a business, you need three separate skill sets. You need the skill of whatever the business is about. Um, when you're a farm-based seed company, that's actually two things, right? The production and then the organizing of all of this seed company stuff. Um, and you need skills about marketing it and then the business admin stuff. And most people, if you're if you're lucky, you can like you're really good at one. Um, if you're lucky, you can do two. And hardly anybody can do all three of those things. And uh, getting the right people on the team to fill in the gaps is crucial. So um, Adaptive Seeds is run by three people, and there's no way we would be where we are without all three of us, mostly um, this woman. Uh, this is Jo Erickson. She's our general manager, and she's been on the team since 2012. She manages the inventory. She is the spreadsheet person on our team. Um, Seed Racks, she does all of our ads, our catalog layout, customer care, mailing lists, all of those things. I just want to farm um, and I guess also do some accounting. I don't really want to do that, but I do it. Um, this is Andrew. Uh, he does our R&D, um, sourcing, plant breeding. He calls it future money. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, right. There might be a little bit of tension there sometimes. Um, <laughs> he, uh, well, it's important though. We really like the work that he does. Really define it defines the varieties that we carry, and and that's really what we're all about. So um, it's it's very valuable his work. Um, he also manages. So he manages the collection. He does the final seed cleaning and most of the tractor work, and uh, he manages our website. Um, does mechanicking and stuff. And here he is in a net house for carrot seed production, which was new for us last year. Um, and then there's me doing field management and field work. And as mentioned, accounting stuff. Here I am thinking there's got to be a better way to get watermelon seed out. Um, I'm open to suggestions. Anyone, if you got a better way, please talk to me later. Not a vine thresher, though. <laughs> um, Right, and so there's um, other people that have helped us in the past year too. Um, to Beth and Joe, there's Dan in the middle, really excited about smashing a pumpkin. Um, and then on the far right is Shelly, and they helped in the field last year as part time. So it's a uh, a lot, a lot of work, a lot of job creation, um, mostly part-time seasonal help. But that's been a big issue for us is finding people that want to come out um, and do the work. Um, so finding the varieties that work isn't always easy. We're always looking for high-quality varieties and strains. Um, we trialed four varieties of January King, again featured here, before choosing the one to grow. Um, Sales or potential sales is one part of the decision-making process, and January King is an easy win there, but not everything is a big seller. And unlike what Tessa indicated earlier, um, and probably most seed companies do, we don't drop things that aren't performing. Um, poster child for that is a millet. <laughs> uh, um, 
there's a number of crops that we grow because we think they need to be around, um, not necessarily because they contribute to our bottom line. They might contribute in other ways to our brand or to round out the catalog or to our goal of bringing biodiversity back. Um, last year, our millet as a category, which was several varieties, um, it was like 0.1%, no, 0 0.01, there it is, one hundredth of 1% of our sales for the year millet. Um, we're not holding our breath that we're going to crack the millet market, but we're always going to have it in our catalog because of its history and potential as a staple crop, especially in the face of climate change. And um, in the meantime, it makes good bird food and it's a good cut flower, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so... Here's another picture of that cabbage with the seed head coming out. To me, it symbolizes potential value um, and just with the recognition that not all value is measured by dollars. So we are here to talk about seed economics. Um, maybe, so now hopefully that graph makes a little more sense. And look, it's big enough that you can read it this time. Um, so, there are a lot of seed company specific expenses and complications that you don't have if you're growing seed for someone else. Um, I did get a lot more into detail at the last Organic Seed Alliance conference um, with the difference between retail and seed rack sales. And there's a few really good spreadsheets there and there's a direct URL to the YouTube video of that. Um, Dan Brisbois also gave a good presentation and Sebastian as well. Um, maybe if you want some more slightly different material on this, there are spreadsheets on that slideshow for those of you that are spreadsheet people. Um, definitely a uh, lot more numbers there than what you're getting from me today. Um, so now we're going to talk about stock seed and trials for a little bit. Um, we, as mentioned before, we did about 120 uh, seed crops that were trials and preservation and plant breeding in 2017. Um, there's the time and space and production expense of that and isolation sacrifice. Sometimes we outsource our trials like this melon party, um, which was really fun eating. Um, the expense of that can be determined easily, but the value of it is much harder to quantify. Um, we also do a whole lot of selection. Um, at the scale that we're at, we don't have that um, foundation, stock, production seed thing. Pretty much everything we grow is all three of those. Um, and so we're doing hard stock selections, um, not with every single crop, every single generation, but as frequently as we can. Um, this is Blower Winter Radish. And um, I planted this at three rows per bed, a couple, um, was it maybe at least six plants per foot, dug them all up and planted them back two rows per bed um, at about 14 inch spacing. So like less than 10% of the best went back in the ground. Um, on our contracts, we ask growers to get rid of the worst 10%. In this case, um, we're keeping the best 10%. And uh, this was still about, 500 radishes that went back in the ground. Um, so we now also have 200 pounds of radishes to get rid of. Anybody want some winter radishes? We have them. Uh, um, here you can see the same field with a couple of different crops. Um, this was just last week. So there's the January king cabbage on the left and some kale and turnips and fava beans also in this shot. Um, so there's also other production considerations, isolation, pollination, and disease management, um, additional infrastructure to manage multiple crops with isolation houses. We're getting more into that. Um, and then there's breeding work. So releasing new varieties is important to our mission, and we've released 16 varieties so far. Um, we like selling breeding pools and diverse populations as a way to help pay for the breeding work, but also because we think populations are more fun and they're more resilient. Um, but before contributing seed to a seed crop, they all need to eva be evaluated too, right? Which um, can be pretty exhausting. <laughs> uh, 
it's real easy to get over it with melon tasting. Um, but the payoff is worth it and the satisfaction is immense. Um, we don't only do uh, breeding pools, though sometimes we do wait for a variety to be stable. This giant purple tomatillo is in its F4 right now. Um, we're going to wait a few more years until we release it. And it was pulled out, um, it was a cross between our Purple Keepers Modern Land Race, which is one of our releases, um, and the giant Plaza Latina green tomatillo. Um, <sighs> Sometimes things need more work. Uh, James here is obviously not pleased with this corn. Um, and reconciling um, what your goals and your needs are with your skills and abilities as a breeder can be challenging. Um, not knowing what's possible, what traits are dominant, et cetera, is a huge puzzle. And having that sorted out for all the crops is, um, yeah. Not, not super easy. James is gonna have to wait a few more years on this corn. Um, sensory evaluations, as previously mentioned, can be super fun and a way of engaging people, but who wants to do sensory evaluations on hot peppers? I, I don't. <laughs> Maybe a, a couple people are, um, are interested in that. Come talk to me later. <laughs> um, so here's Andrew doing selections on um, based on agronomic traits, so early maturity and productivity on the adaptive early Thai hot pepper. Um, all varieties that we breed are open pollinated. Um, other companies sell things with different variety protections. I think there's workshops about intellectual property later in the conference, um, but just quickly, there's PVPs, plant variety protection, that's 20 years of protection for an open pollinated variety for about $5,000 if all conditions are met. Um, there's patents from the patent trade office, license agreements, some universities require this. Um, and then of course there's hybrids where only the seed company knows the parent, so they're necessarily proprietary. Um, we release all of our uh, breeding projects through the open source seed initiative um, so the Aussie for short protects varieties and their progeny from being covered by any of the above um, so seed that is pledged open source um, is sold accompanied with this pledge that says that you have the freedom to use these Aussie pledged seeds in any way you choose and you pledge not to restrict others use of them or their derivatives by patents licenses or other means and to include this pledge with any transfer of seeds um, and there's more information available at osseeds.org um, proprietary mechanisms are a non-starter for us for ethical reasons um, we embrace an open source spirit and acknowledge that seeds are a common resource we believe that plant genetic material should not be owned and we prefer to live in a framework of abundance and we see intellectual property as taking a community resource and making it temporarily owned by an individual or institution, which is theft. We also believe that it stifles innovation. Um, so um, the Gulag Stars Kale is another diverse population that we actually got from Tim Peters, um, who bred it in Southern Oregon and from this, we selected out Simone Kale um, in collaboration with the Culinary Breeding Network. This is new for 2018 and it's pledged open source. Um, so along with IP, there is uh, the concept of royalties. I'm just going to talk briefly about that. Um, the general concept is that the retailer pays 5 to 10 percent back to the owner of the intellectual property and it's required as part of PVPs and other licensing agreements. Um, we will not sign an official licensing agreement that requires royalties, but we do pay voluntary, we call them liberties. Um, and because we wanna share some value back to the plant breeders whose shoulders we're standing on. Um, this is Larry again, standing on the shoulders of Carol Deppie's Oregon Homestead Sweetmeat Squash, uh, which is an open, OSSI variety that we pay liberties on. So just quickly about them, um, liberties are voluntary. Um, they're sliding scale, they can be based on a number of factors, usually it's money in the bank. Um, and we prefer to frame them as encouragement 
for breeders to keep producing, not payment for work that was previously done. We only pay them on seed that we grow ourselves or purchase from a third party, not on seed that's purchased from the breeder. So Frank Morton varieties that we purchase from him don't earn liberties because he's already capturing value from our sale of his varieties. Sometimes we produce seed much cheaper than we could purchase from the breeder. Um, even with paying liberties, it's more affordable than buying directly, such as with the sweet meat squash. Um, in 2017, about $1,000 went to this. Uh, this is an additional cost, but it's something we're happy to pay, and we think of it as a sort of profit sharing. As plant breeders, we don't invent anything. We build upon what came before, and plant germplasm is part of the planet's inheritance, and we think it should stay that way. We're arming on stolen land, and we don't need to steal anymore. Mm. Thanks. Uh, we, we might not be able to change much of the past and what has been taken, but we can prevent more from being taken, and we can do our part to reverse this particular decline. This graph is of open pollinated cabbages available for sale from 1981 on the left to 2004. Um, this appeared in the garden seed inventory that was published by the Seed Savers Exchange. Um, this edition was published the second year that Andrew and I started farming, and it was hugely influential on our path. Um, we're trying to reverse the trend one cabbage at a time. Uh, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks again to the Risk Management Agency for providing funding for today, and to the Organic Seed Alliance for organizing this. Thanks, Sarah. Um, next, we're gonna have Sebastian Aguilar. He's gonna talk about more about um, wholesale contracting and that kind of business. All right, so my task was to talk about the pros and cons about small-scale wholesale uh, seed production, which is what we do at our farm, which is Chickadee Farm. We're in Talent, Oregon. It's about three hours south of here. Um, that was this year's crew in the middle there, uh, Jeff, my wife Kelly, and Ramses, and myself. So the four of us, uh, we manage 20 acres. We do, oh, maybe four acres of actual seed production. Um, and it's all just seed, so, um, and it's all wholesale. Um, our main customers are High Mowing Seed, Seed Savers Exchange, AP Whaley. Um, we sell to a few other companies. Um, yeah, and we've been there five years, so we've been growing for 20. Uh, we were fresh market growers for a long time. Decided to finally just kind of switch gears, get out of the fresh market business, and um, yeah, we've been enjoying seed a lot. So, you know, there's a lot of different people in this room. Um, you guys all have a special niche. You're either with a seed company, you're a grower, you're selling direct. You know, it's hard to tailor these presentations to everybody. So I'm just going to give you my experience and hopefully that'll be valuable. So we sell to mid-sized companies, um, like I mentioned. And... Our lot sizes vary quite a bit. Um, they're anywhere from 500 to 25,000. You know, if I average all of them, it's usually two to 4,000 for a lot. And they, uh, they average to a 16th of an acre as well. So in the big scheme of things, you know, we're, we're tiny. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so we're, we've, right now we just focus on OP varieties and you know, if you're just getting into the seed business and you're wondering, you know, what am I going to make by selling seed to a seed company? Generally, you can look at their catalog, you know, look at the biggest uh, bulk price that they've got. Half of that is going to be more or less, you know, what you're going to get. It varies a little bit, but it's a good ballpark. You know, if you're going to get into the business, um, basically you're looking to get your contracts in January or May, January for spring seeded things, May for fall seeded crops. Um, you deliver all your seeds in December, you get paid in January and February, do it all over again. Um, 
obviously when you're selling to somebody who's reselling quality is of the utmost importance they want their reputation to be good you want your reputation to be good so uh seeds obviously got to be clean good germ disease free true to type obviously that makes sense to everybody um you know but it seems like as you go up the ladder those things become more and more important so what are the benefits um marketing is pretty simple at one point you know obviously you got to get your foot in the door you got to build these relationships with people that isn't always necessarily easy um, but once you're in as long as you're fulfilling your contracts you're communicating you've got good quality um, you know it can go pretty smooth this year was the smoothest year for me um, within one week I had three phone calls and I had pretty much all of my contracts for the year so that felt great <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, coming from a fresh market perspective where I had to go to farmer's market every weekend, it's a nice change. Um, you know, in terms of what we're growing right now, it's a pretty good balance of diversity and lot size. So, you know, we're still small scale. I'm still part time. I'm still going to grow the business. Um, but last year, for example, we grew 42 lots of seed, so 42 varieties. Um, not how many shirt of species that is, probably maybe 20 or something. Um, so it's a good balance. And you know, all of these pictures that I've been showing you are kind of typical lots. There's five beds of tomatoes. There's a 40 pound lot of lettuce. There's bok choy on the left. There's um, a 75 pound radish crop. So you kind of get the idea of, of what we're doing. There's the same radish. You know, the other benefits are that we're really lucky to work with some great companies and they've um, treated us really good and they've seen us as partners. And so we really appreciate that. Um, you know, and it's not really that different from going to farmer's market and you build up your customer base and they, they appreciate your work, they support you. Um, it's been the same thing here. So that's been really nice to find. Um, you know, ways that they've supported us are basically really just asking, you know, what do you need? How can we help your business to succeed? Um, and, you know, so things I can mention are, well, you know, you bought X amount of dollars last year. In terms of planning for next year, you know, are we going to be in the same ballpark? You know, how is your model changing? What varieties are you going to need? Um, this worked really well. This isn't working really well. Okay, well, let's tweak that. Um, with some companies, we've gone to a flat rate for certain crops, you know, like tomatoes. You can get anywhere from one pound a bed to seven pounds a bed. And, you know, if we're growing new crops or new varieties of those, we have no idea what we're going to get. They don't usually know what they're going to get. So we're like, okay, well, let's just set this price and whatever we get, we get. Obviously, that takes a while because they have to come to the farm. They have to see how we do things. They have to trust us that, you know, we're going to do a good job. We're going to get as much as we can out of that bed. But that's a great way um, that they've been able to help us. Um, and then if I have problems throughout the season, if there's a disease issue, a pest issue, I can call, you know, hey, will you guys pay for this testing? Will you do that? You know, if they can, they will. If they can't, you know. They offer, maybe they've got somebody in-house who can give me advice. Um, but anyways, you've got a partner there, so that, that feels good. So then, of course, there's always challenges. Farming is not easy. Um, pricing can be one of the challenges. You know, some things are priced decently. Some things are priced really low. And a lot of that just depends on, you know, what is the rest of the industry doing? So, you know, because we're a small scale, Grower, our niche is to be able to grow a lot of something, not a lot, but um, a specific grow out of a specific variety that isn't available on a larger market, you know, right? So, so if somebody needs this variety and you can't go anywhere else to get it, then, you know, we're the right people to come to because we can do it um, for you and you don't have to buy a thousand pounds, you can buy a hundred, you can buy whatever. Um, but if I grow a variety that someone else in California or Chile or China is growing, then obviously, you know, I'm going to be in a whole different ballgame. 
or if it's a variety that's really popular and lots of companies are buying it, you know, and somebody is growing it on 50 acres and just combining it, you know, obviously I'm not going to be able to compare on that price point either. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of times we get offered crops and I'm like, well, you know, I'm just at that pr price point, I can't, I can't grow it. It's not worth it for me. And so obviously part of this game is knowing, you know, what is worth it and what isn't um, and, and being choosy. So, you know, especially if you're new and you're getting into the business, just realize you'll probably take on some contracts that you are going to lose money on and uh, don't just do those. <laughs> Account for them. Start small, experiment, you know, play it safe. Um, so another challenge is that we face a lot of change. Um, you know, when you when we were fresh market growers, we were picking the varieties, we were picking the crops based on whatever we thought was best for us. Now the game that I'm playing is every January, I'm like, hmm, I wonder what I'm gonna end up growing this year. Gotta wait for those phone calls. You know, I mean, sure, there's a little bit of stability, um, but varieties change, you know, the mix of crops change, the amount of each crop changes sometimes. Um, you know, I grew a crop that I really liked the year before and nobody needs it this year. There's just a lot of fluctuation there. Um, and so as a contract grower, that's been, that's been kind of difficult. There again, you know, some of the companies have realized that that's a challenge for me and they're like, okay, well, let's, uh, you know, let's pick this species and, and, and try to find one every year and we'll just, you know, switch varieties and maybe alternate. And once you do a variety, well, you know, we'll come back to that one every three years. And, you know, it just takes time to kind of build that kind of rotation. Um, But, uh, you know, and with another thing with the frequent change issue is just crop rotation. How, how do you plan out what your rotation is going to be? Because if one year I'm growing a half acre of um, radish and the next year I'm growing no radish, I mean, that's fine. But it's hard to make like a three to five year crop rotation if you don't know even what species you're going to grow. So, you know, and that just might be my situation. I'm five years into, I mean, we've been growing seed on contract for maybe seven, eight years. Um, but five years, I guess, has been, it's been our main focus. And so, you know, we're still kind of building those relationships. This is a long-term project um, and, and hopefully things will stabilize over time. I mentioned the contract timing. Um, this year was actually great. Uh, you know, it's still relatively early, although I was able to, uh, disc up two acres yesterday, so that felt good. Um, not happy about drought conditions in Southern Oregon, but uh, it does work for early tillage. Um, but you know, sometimes it's like, if you're getting those contracts in February or March, you know, it's, um, it's already go time. And so it's hard to, it's hard to even plan like where everything is gonna go, what's my isolation needs gonna be. Another challenge that I face is I have to borrow money every year. We'll talk about cash flow in a second but you know I'm spending all my money in the over the course of the season including paying myself living expenses and then I get paid the next January um, and so so I go to FSA I take out operating loans but for them to give me the loans I've got to show them the contracts I've got to prove to them that I'm going to be able to pay back those loans so to get the loans I need the contracts there's all this processing time from the time I put in my application and then talk to FSA and then get my money so, you know, it's always a little bit of a rush in the spring. Market risk. Um, one thing that I realize and feel vulnerable about is if I only have four main customers, if one of them changes strategy, that's a huge impact on my business, right? So, you know, I don't see any of them doing anything too quickly, but I need to make sure that I'm communicating with them and making sure that, you know, I'm not going to get any surprises because if 30% of my potential income or, you know, market just disappears in one year, then that's going to be um, a big impact. So how do you, you know, how do you regain control? I mean, obviously with contract growing, it's more of a communication and a relationship building um, thing. You know, obviously we could consider, you know, direct marketing seeds, but as Sarah just showed us, you know, it's, it's a huge thing. It's taking on a whole nother business. Um, and so, you know, it's definitely something you wanna consider carefully. 
Um, you know, the other thing about market, it's not necessarily a risk, but one of the challenges that we're coming up against too is at the scale that we're working at, you know, people will need, you know, let's say an average of 100 pounds for a brassica crop. So if I can grow 500 pounds, you know, I, I kind of want to find a 500 pound contract because that's obviously a lot simpler for me and more profitable. Um, but there's only so many of those out there in the marketplace right now. Um, so, you know, if I could get some more isolations, that's a, that's a potential way to increase my overall market. Um, what am I trying to say here? Let me put it better. I'd like to grow my business and then I'm sort of hitting a wall with how to do that without taking on more isolations. And obviously that's an option, but to get equipment three miles down the road, you know, besides driving my old farm all at, you know, slow speeds, um, hasn't worked out great yet. So, so then I'm like, okay, well, do I either increase my scale and go to customers who need an acre at a time of certain crops? Or do I, um, you know, sell direct? Or what do I do? You know, how many, if I can only find so many 100 pound lots or 500 pound lots, um, I'm kind of stuck with that one isolation. So it's just been an interesting um, realization getting into the business. Obviously, another way is to, to broaden the diversity of the species that we're growing. So, you know, we're doing that. You can only do so many brassicas. You can only do one onion. Um, so, okay, well, we'll do flowers and herbs. We'll add all those things. But there again, you know, lot sizes might be smaller. Um, and then we, we're coming into crops that maybe you need specialized equipment for to get it to the, the cleanliness that you want or even the price point that you need. Cash flow, I talked about quality risks, you know, in fresh market farming, I mean, in any farming, obviously there's always tons of risk in terms of whether you're gonna get a successful crop. Um, but sometimes when you're selling it fresh and you know, you've got a loss to insect or disease, you can see that right from the beginning and you just go ahead and till that in and you've obviously lost, you've invested production costs and you know, you lose those, but sometimes with a seed crop, you go ahead and finish the production, you clean the seed, you send it in, and they're like, oh, well, it just came back with a virus, or, you know, germ is just below, you know, what you can, uh, what we can sell it for. So, so sometimes, and it hasn't happened too often, but when it has happened, you know, and, and you think you're getting $5,000, and all of a sudden you're like, well, nope, <laughs> I guess not. You know, those can, those can kind of hit you hard. Um, you know, obviously there you just have to expect some of those grow at a scale where a $5,000 loss doesn't really hurt that bad and, and keep going. So the other challenge is um, cleaning equipment. We've got an air screen cleaner. We can get things pretty darn clean, but if we're going to sell to a company that doesn't have cleaning equipment, you know, 98% 99% clean doesn't really cut it. You know, it's got to be 99.8% clean. Um, and so, you know, it's not an insurmountable thing. Indent cylinder, uh, um, you know, maybe a, a debeater would be helpful. A couple just small things, would, you know, we can get it to the next step and then we can expand our customer base and take it to offer our seed to companies that don't have any cleaning equipment and uh, have something that they can just put right in the packet. Um, so those are the main pros and cons. Went pretty quick. There's a picture of one of our fields. Thank you, USDA. Um, so yeah, um, we've got 15 minutes left. Sarah's gonna come back up here. We're gonna take questions together and um, go from there. Uh, I have a question for Sebastian. What is your uh, bed spacing? It looked like, uh, what's your bed spacing? It Five feet like on center. Feet. Five feet on center. 
or beds facing. Yeah. Is there another dimension you want? It looked like one of your p earlier pictures you had like uh, a row of crops and then an empty row or like that, that one you have drip tape and maybe the pathways or something. I was just curious so, about that. Yeah, that's two rows per bed and just that full canopy. Same thing there, two rows per bed, full canopy. And what, then what do you do is like, um, it looked like you had a row of crop and then an empty row. Or yeah, empty bed, like right there, right there. What's what's going on there? That's people's space. Okay. That's so we can get in there and harvest. Um, yeah. So, otherwise, yeah, okay. we're important too. <laughs> Is there a need for more small scale contract grow? I'm over here. Sorry. Um, is there a need for more small scale contract growers? Um, what is the competition between um, farmers who want more contracts with seed companies look like? Well, you've got some seed companies coming up, so they'll be able to tell you that, and Sarah can address that. But I think there's a need. I, I was basically going to say there's some other people going to talk about that later, I think, a little bit. OK, thank you. I think it, it depends what crops you want, and it can be I mean, because I know a few people who are getting into the business and they're struggling at finding the right crops. I mean, it's a balance between their experience and then their uh, their capacity. And um, yeah, I think it's it, it varies. So it depends about how big of a lot you're looking for, too. Uh, so, Sebastian, so how how do you address that as you're growing your your contracts and your relationships with various buyers? Oftentimes you get maybe some contracts that might be a little bit more marginal for you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you work through those, I guess, those barriers? Because you want to be successful, um, because you want to build that relationship, but at the same time, so you can't turn away the contract necessarily because you want to also grow that relationship. Um, how have you found working back and forth with those buyers so that you can you know, find your successes and also meet their needs. Yeah. Um, well, just talking about it is one, you know, so if you're like, well, I can't make any, I'm not making any money on this. There's a few things that happen. I mean, what, sometimes we'll get paid extra money at the end of the season. I'm like, I lost money on that. And they're like, okay, well, Here's a little bit of extra money. You know, let me help you out. Um, sometimes I'll take on something knowing that I might not make any money on it. But I'm like, well, let me figure it out a little bit. I'll just do this as a loss leader to, A, learn more about the crop, experiment, see if I can't figure it out, and to make it a, something that I can do efficiently. And then it helps them out as well. Um, you know, sometimes that first year for a new species or a new variety, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of risk. So minimum risk saying, okay, well, let me just grow 10 pounds. You know, you offered me 100. I'm just going to grow 10. Let's see how it does. If I lose money on that, that's no big deal. Um, what else? And then just saying no, you know, I'm, I'm okay to say no because... It, if it doesn't make sense, it just doesn't make sense, you know. Someone else can do it better in a different climate with different equipment. Um, yeah, you know, or, or 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 throwing out a price, say, I can do this, I'll be happy to do this, but I need this amount per pound. And then it's the, in their ball court, you know, and, and they can say yes or no and go from there. Mm -hmm. um, over here, this corner. When you are doing this type of business, uh, what are the data? Do you do any R&D as part of your operation, research and development? And what data do you really capture there? And uh, how do you use that data to improve on your operations? And uh, maybe for us to be able to learn from each other how to capture that and put it into use. Yeah, well, I mean, Obviously, the key data here is yield 
Um, and so, you know, we obviously keep good records of our yields. Um, you know, we're always looking for other sources of information for yield. And then, you know, like with most crops, yield is going to vary a lot between year and variety. And so, you know, as your data set grows bigger, you can, you know, your averages get better and better. Um, but then just knowing what the range, potential range is, and we'll, and we'll be looking at that a little bit later on, um, is kind of the key. And there again, that's where, you know, if you have a relationship with a buyer and it's something new and they don't know anything about it and you don't really know anything about it, you know, you can bring up, well, you know, this could yield one pound or this could yield seven, you know, what do we do if it yields one? What do we do if it yields seven? And you just kind of have that conversation. Um, and so, and then obviously yield isn't everything because some crops are a lot more labor intensive than others. So knowing, you know, how much you're going to have to put into something um, is also a big part of the equation. Uh, so I do have a question for both of you. I'll be quick. Um, I'll start with you, Sebastian, since you're there. Can you talk about your labor costs relative to when you were market gardening or like with adaptive where you've got all the packaging and all that stuff going on and getting a sense of what your net return is after you've uh, got labor calculated into that? Yeah, so, um, well, at least on our farm, as an example, this past year, we had uh, my wife and I, and then two helpers, and one of them was an employee hourly, and one of them was an apprentice. Um, what did I pay them? I can't remember what the total came to. It's probably about 15% of uh, expenses. Um, so, you know, I'm still part-time. I've got a couple other jobs. Um, trying to grow it. We did a, about $100,000 of seed, and uh, this year was a good year. We probably kept expenses down to 50000 so yeah. And then, Sarah, just a quick question, and maybe for Andrew if he's in the room. I'm curious, when you're doing your um, trials, when you're trialing a new variety, are you taking that to the seed stage to get a sense of its yield and its productivity in, in the seed production process, which is obviously important for you and calculating your potential yield and uh, future cash? Um, that would be really great if we did that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the time, no. Um, while seed yield is really important because that's our, our bottom line, it's not the thing that we're looking for primarily when we're choosing varieties. Um, we're going to look at that a little bit later with the farmer case studies and see how, I mean, Sebastian's talked about it too, just how drastically different yield can be and how that really, really does affect the bottom line at the retail scale as well. Is there somebody back here? Oh, go ahead, Edmund. I have a question about um, stock seed. Do you, um, do you tend to save your own stock seed and use that for future grow outs? Um, or like how often do you do that? And also like, to see companies ever pay you to do special stock seed selection or other selection. And also, um, does it like, do you have situations where you get seed that's crossed up and you have this big crop, crop out there that's messed up? And what arrangements do you have with seed companies for that kind of situation? Yeah, all of the above. Um, <laughs> So there are a few crops that we do uh, stock seed selection on and regrow. Um, most of what we grow, the stock seed is sent to us by the seed company. And I often don't really get to hear the backstory of, you know, how well it's been managed or not. Um, we have grown out lots where we were sent stock seed and then what popped up was not what the customer wanted. Um, he went ahead and and bit the bullet and paid us anyways. Well, let's see, how did that go? We didn't make as much as we were planning on. So I guess we kind of split the loss a little bit. Um, and and I do pick stock seed for people so I, I can go through and um, make a separate stock seed lot and then I charge them, usually I charge like $100 to send them, you know, I don't know, an ounce of 
something that I handpicked out. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. My question is for Sebastian. Um, I'd like to know what um, what's your most valuable investment in terms of uh, cleaning equipment? Um, well, we couldn't really live without an air screen cleaner, so, you know, a clipper. Um, after that, probably a scalping table. We had our uh, neighbor custom build us one, and so it's just like a, you know, it's just the top screen of a clipper, but it's a giant, giant, <laughs> three by six uh, gas powered scalping table. So we can just, after we thresh things, just throw it on there and it really quickly takes things down um, and gets it ready for winnow or even the clipper. And then I do have a plot combine that comes in handy for certain crops. So I was able to find that cheap and got lucky. Can I ask what, uh, which crops do you use the combine for? Um, I use it for chard and sunflowers, uh, radish, uh, kind of a variety of things. It works more or less good depending on the crop, but sometimes it's even just helpful to run it through that and, you know, reduce the volume and then I can use a different tool to kind of finish clean it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. Oh, there's one on the okay. webinar. Um, this is from one of our online attendees here. Um, where and how did you learn the technical part of seed growing? <laughs> um, well, let's see. I had some great friends at Organic Seed Alliance. Um, and lots of trial and error. Um, you know, and then once you get into it and you make friends who are also growing seed, um, you know, you can ask them questions. So, but yeah, trial and error is probably the, <laughs> the best teacher. Sure, Sarah's got a good answer for that. It's oh. pretty, pretty much the same answer, actually. Um, yeah. Sessions uh, put on by OSA, Finding Mentors, is really great, but uh, we never worked for anybody else to teach us this stuff or learned it in school. Definitely did not learn this in school. Yeah, I got a, a question for Sarah. Um, you mentioned that you don't use uh, sales to really drive um, whether or not you determine to drop a variety, but as far as economic indicators to add new varieties within a crop, like mm -hmm. how do you decide whether you want, and maybe it's just purely personal choice and aesthetical interest and breeding interest, but how do you decide whether to add, maybe have 14 kales versus 12 kales, and if kales are selling really well, maybe we could add a couple more and increase sales, but maybe that'll dilute overall kale sales instead. So do you, get, do you have a kind of a, a logical process when you to determine that, or is it more just in, intuition? Um, that's a crop by crop situation. Um, I sh should clarify that we do also make economic decisions. If something's not selling, we do we do drop things. Um, you know, we have 100 tomatoes, the bottom 10 can go away um, sometimes. But um, yeah, I think knowing, figuring out when adding a new variety of a crop type will cannibalize the sales from another uh, thing it's it's really tricky and we've learned the hard way a, a few times with that so um, I think just assessing the the growth of a category on its own is one way that you can sort of suss that out um, but it's not a hard science unfortunately maybe other uh, seed company reps have have some magic sauce but to figure that out but we're not there yet All right, thanks guys. Appreciate it.